take the word of God to the devil when he comes your way because Christian, I'm telling you, if you're waiting to touch the Bible when you come on Sunday, if you're waiting to serve God when you come to church on Sunday, if you're waiting to praise and live and worship God and you're waiting to do it all on Sunday, man, you're missing the mark. You're missing the point. Your worship will begin at home, alone time, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not saying you got to disturb the peace and run up and down the road and scream and holler. I'm talking sometimes your greatest worship is you and God in silence in the midnight hours. So Sometimes your greatest closeness with God is being still and knowing that God is God, but he is in your presence. Yeah. But when you read the Bible, read it carefully, understand it rightly, divide it. That means knowing how to take it, dissect it for what it's worth, and then rightly dividing also the other half of that division is how to apply it. Yes, yes, thank you. And when we do this, Read it carefully and study it prayerfully. Amen. The Word of God has got to be. Listen, folks, this is not an option. Christian, the Word of God should be your companion in yes. life. Thank you. Take it wherever you go. Don't be bashful. I know you're not ashamed, but the devil does fight us with bashfulness. Amen. I've heard preachers say, well, you're just ashamed of the Bible. You're just ashamed to take a stand in public. I broke my heart. I've never been ashamed of you, Lord, but I need boldness. Yes. Pray for boldness. Amen. Pray for boldness to be that warrior with God's word in your head. I know you're not ashamed. I know that. God knows you're not ashamed. Ain't nobody in this building ashamed of God's word. Reality is we need boldness to take that stand. Yes. The devil, I promise you, his folks are taking the stand and that they'll carry whatever they want wherever they go and they'll boldly do it because by golly, they'll say that's my right in life. Well, here's your right. right. Take the word of God to the world and take it to the devil yes. and take a strong stand with God's word. May it be your greatest companion in life. For the word became flesh and dwelt among men. You can't worship and say you worship Jesus and neglect this book. There's your contradictory. Yes, you're right. Jesus took the word of God to the devil. He did. I want to park it there because really the full 11 verses was not so much the message today, but Jesus' reaction in verse 4, our power verse, it was in your bulletin that Chuck read. And I want to look at some things today. Why? There's the question. Why do we need God's Word to be our companion in life? Jesus refers Satan to the Word of God. I want you to understand that. If Jesus instructed me to refer Satan himself to the Word of God, how much more does he expect me to stand upon the word of truth and refer the world to the word of God? Now, you think about that for a minute. Why would he take the moment in time, knowing the world is dying and going to hell, needs a little bit of the word, and tell me to take it to the devil and not mean that even more so take it to those who have a chance, an opportunity? The devil's done. See, I've gotten so mad at the devil before. I have shouted, screamed, and hollered in his face in my vehicle, storming mad at Satan, laughed in his face, said, devil, you have no hope I do. Torment me all you want, but you are a dead man walking in eternity's fire. And all you want is somebody to go with you. Well, I'm not your somebody. And you have no hope and I have nothing but pure hope. Hallelujah. And God's word should be my greatest companion. If I move God's word out of my life, what does that leave me to combat Satan with? You tell me. Not a thing. We live in a world that's obsessed with praise and worship. I just hope they're praise and worshiping something other than praise and worship. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. yes. I'm so sick of that stuff. 
Half of these people out here, that that's all they do. They got to go to church that has nine pastors to lather you up to get excited, and they call that praise and worship. If their praise and worship takes nine preachers to get them stirred up instead of the Holy Spirit within them, if it takes a song to bring the Holy Spirit out of me instead of the Holy Spirit to bring the song out of me, there's a problem with my style of worship. Paul and Silas had an earthquake with no strings, instruments, or nothing, and shook the earth beneath him and busted the prison bars open. Don't tell me that God's Holy Spirit takes the command from any kind of man-made emotion. The Holy Spirit will give that man that's made of God the emotion that's led of the Holy yes, Spirit. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, anyway, Jesus here, look at this. We got to find our worship in the Word of God. Yes. Reading carefully, praying. Guys, praying prayerfully, studying prayerfully. <coughs> but we're talking about making God's Word your companion. What is it about God's Word that makes it more sufficient than bread? It's living. It's living. It is living, it is the living Word. Somebody once quoted the term phrase, I wish I could be the one that said it. You know what they said? I've read many books in my life, but it was the Word of God that reads me. That's right. That's right. The Bible likens it to a mirror, a looking glass, to a man that looked at this book one day and saw who he was yeah. and had the option to walk away. That's right. Or the option to conform to the ways of God. We say mirror, mirror on the wall and all of that stuff. Who's the beautifulest of all them all? Whatever. The Jesus should be uh, the fairest one. Jesus should be the fairest one in our sight. Yes. That's right. The Word of God should direct our steps. The Word of God, getting back to the second question, what is it about God's Word that's more efficient than bread? Let's discuss a couple things. One, in John 17, 17 in your Bibles, you can turn. I'm going to move along a little bit here. But in John 17, 17, we're going to answer that question a little bit. John's Gospel, chapter 17, along about verse 17. Let's see what it says here. We're discussing making God's word our companion in life. And why? Oh, look at this right here. Speaking of the testimony of the holiness of believers. Look at this. I'll back up to verse 16 and read a, read a couple of these. They are not of the world. Now remember John chapter 17 was that beautiful conversation between Christ and the heavenly father. Yes. Some call it the real Lord's Prayer. But he is speaking. This is Jesus talking to God. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, Jesus speaking of himself. But look at verse 17, our power verse. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is thy truth. Amen. Imagine a Christian for a moment without the word of God. How did he get saved? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes. And we are sanctified by the word of God. When you are saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, saves you, sanctifies you. But there is a progressive sanctification in your life. That means that God begins to nurture, disciple, mentor that great schoolmaster that the Holy Spirit will be as the Paracletus with you. He will sanctify you daily, drawing you closer to God, walking in the Spirit and worshiping God in the Spirit, living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. And so there is... A ongoing sanctifying of our life. One, we're sanctified when we're saved. Two, there's a progressive sanctification. Imagine with that being said now, where does that sanctification come, Christian? If you're a Christian that never reads his Bible, got saved, and thinks that it's not an important component, I hope you take this message as serious as you have ever taken one. You are literally killing yourself as a Christian. Right. You're robbing yourself of so much joy. The Word of God should be your companion. Why? Because it knows more insights about you than you know yourself in relation to God. The Bible knows more about your future than you understand in relation to God. It 
sanctified you when you were saved. You had faith, and that faith cometh by hearing the word of God. You were saved. God sanctified you with the word, and now you have the responsibility to allow the word daily to sanctify you in that progressive sanctification that we know comes through drawing closer unto God. Amen. Oh, my goodness gracious, the word. Word. I believe it was John Watson or Thomas Watson rather said, but let not the Bible only inform you, but let it inflame you. I can't wait to this revival. I love the whole tent revival concept. My Bible said, Scott, seek out the old paths and walk therein. Yes. You know what? I'm not saying be a formalist or a formalist. I'm not saying get stuck in your ways. I'm not one that's going to trash everything today and just look into the Bible said, don't look on the former days and get hung up in them for it's not wise. I'm not doing that, but I do think there were some prescriptions back then that would do us a lot of good to revisit and apply as we assess and move forward in this big work called the gospel ministry. Amen. What is so wrong with that? People come out last time we was out there and looking forward to and unfortunately COVID kind of tackled us like a linebacker there for a couple years. But you know what? We're tackling back as we get back into this and there are going to be people like last time. They'll come out. They'll come out Taco Bell. They'll come out a long John Captain D's, whatever. And they'll have them something and they'll wonder and they'll come over there like that fell on his bicycle. Right. And I encourage you, this is a different setting. Don't let the devil turn it into some kind of religious gathering. This is a salvation gathering. Come with whatever, eat dinner on the grounds, sit outside the tent, sit in the tent, but come and be part of the fellowship and let's bring the gospel to the greater Fayette County area. Yeah, yeah. Every little bit does make a difference. Yeah. Little as much when God is in it. The power, Jeremiah said in chapter 23, verse 29, you don't have to turn there, said that his power is a fire and a hammer. And one other time when Jeremiah was a little disgruntled in his physical setting and his spiritual man was the fire burning inside, Jeremiah sat down one time aggravated and said, I'll just shut my mouth and quit where I'm at. But I couldn't because the word of God was a fire burning inside yes. of me. Yes, amen. Woo, how do you live this life, Christian, when the Word is not your companion? I don't understand it. We're asking the question, why is making the Word of God your companion so important? Because it is the truth, John 17, 17. We're sanctified by the truth. We have covered that. We know it's a fire and a hammer. It's the unction, that dynamic, which is the power of God in our lives. It's a manual. Everything else in life has a manual. Yes. What's wrong with the Bible? Be in your life manual with God. Amen. Everything is a manual. And guys, for those of you like me that don't like to read instructions and manuals and you pull it out of the box or whatever it is and assume that that's your last resort, don't do that with the Word of God. Let it be your first resort. This is one time, guys, specifically, read the directions as you get up each day. Yes, yes. God has directions for your day. It's called the Bible. He comforts us in John chapter 14. Let me share that one with you. John's gospel chapter 14. We see the word coming through the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, that being Jesus, and Jesus is the word, it all ties together. Yeah. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So if Christ, listen, if the Holy Spirit comes through his word and you eliminate the word, Christian, where's the Holy Spirit coming from? And if the Holy Spirit comes to the Word, which Christ just said, He is the Word and the Comforter, the Holy Spirit will come through the Word. You sever that line of communication off. Right. How in the world do you expect sanctification daily? How do you expect a way to fight the devil? Jesus took the Word to the devil right there in the Mount of Temptation. Yes. I don't know about you, but if Jesus is going to use His sword to fight the devil... And that's going to be his very first punch in round one. 
I believe I'm going to use the word of God to be the very first punch in round one of each morning. Yes. My goodness, we're talking about making God's word your companion. Let's talk about a couple other things. The Bible told me that the truth will set me free. Yes. The Bible just told me also that God's word is the truth. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God and all that. And we read everything. We understand that. Listen to what he said in John chapter 8, verse 52, 32, 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. Listen to this. I'll back up to verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. This is Jesus exhorting the believers. That means he was urging earnestly there. He said many believed on him. Maybe they were saved at that point too. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in what my word, then are ye my disciples. Well, I, just, I, I was sprinkled when I was six years old. I'm good to go. I live like the devil. You didn't even know your left hand from your foot at six months old. How did you know that to make a conscious decision exactly. to say yes to your Lord and Savior? Exactly. I'm all for dedicating babies, but parents, grandparents, whomever, please don't set children on the confusing course to think that they are saved by putting water on their head at one year old. Right. And they go their whole life thinking that they are right with God. But for some reason, they're confused because the fruit in their life doesn't show what they've been told they are. Right. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, I'll mention under the tent, Lord willing, in a few days. And a prepared place for a prepared people is indicative that one must make a conscious decision to say yes to God and no to the world. It is a conscious decision to not only just put addition of Christ to your life, but subtraction of the world to your life. And when you're saved and you experience that daily sanctification by the word, guess what God can do? He can clean you up a little more each day, a little more each day. How's that happen? By the administering of the word of God, which should be, back to our title, the companion of your life. Amen. My goodness gracious, I was saved because of the word of God. Yeah. It brought salvation in my life. And that takes me to Titus chapter 2 over here in the back of the Bible. Listen to what it says here. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, listen, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. There's that living hope, as she mentioned living word, rather, and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Lord Jesus, or Amen. Jesus Christ. Yes. My goodness gracious. Well, my generation's different, preacher. Well, I got news for you. God's been the same yesterday, today, and forever. God. Now, that means that God doesn't change his standards, listen no, now, no, based no. on generational changes. No, no. Well, it's not fair. They didn't have that many things in the 30s and 40s. Well, the Bible said that God made man upright, and they sought out many inventions. Guess what? We're a victim of our culture. Deal with it and move on. Yes. God's grace is sufficient, I yes. promise you. Yes. So in other words, be the game changer of your time. Don't get caught up in the one behind you. Focus on what God has got for you today. Amen. We're talking about m making God's word your very companion in life. The word of God is going to purify your soul, Christians. And that comes out of Peter. Let me share one with you here. Chapter 1 of Peter. That's 1 Peter. Listen to this. Chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth... That is, the word is the truth. Yes. Through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. That means unshaken. That means a love that is strong for the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And the Bible says, how do you tell one is passed from life unto death? How do you tell somebody is true born again believer? The hallmark is Amen. that they have love for the brethren. Yes, See, just like a shoe with laces. You just lace it up. It looks slouchy and loose. And you draw it up. And it just pulls it together. Mm 
And so the word works like that in our lives. It's absolutely the truth. I look about these things and I realize if more people made the word of God their companion in life, it would clean your life up. Did you know that the word of God is your greatest TV guide? Who remembers TV guides in here? Kids, don't even try. You don't remember what TV guide is. They're like, yeah, you push that button on the road, it says guide. No, I mean the TV guide that's sat in every checkout at every grocery store. Do they even have them now? I don't know. I ain't gonna lie to you. I used to love the TV guide. It's the only magazine I hardly ever read. What's that? Christmas tree. The Bible is a great TV guide in that it will convict you. It will. It will. We're all tempted to drift into a... Uh, 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 other areas with a remote. We're all tempted to drift into other areas with the radio or a CD or whatever. That that stuff is out there, guys. I'm telling you, no other preacher would probably say it, but this one and you and every one of us, if you don't watch out, you'll drift into them areas. And, buddy, you'd be like that little kid, so be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. They didn't make an adult version of that song. Same thing goes. Or maybe we just need to get our childlike faith out like we talked about Habakkuk in there, and mind the Lord more. But it, it's really true. Absolutely. Let's move on. I'm about done. Let's look at this. We are winding up making God's word our companion. Guess what, guys? And I want you to understand this. Women, too. But there seems to be a real problem in society with men being spiritual leaders in life and in their families. But the word of God in 2 Timothy chapter 3 will make a man God's man. Make no mistake about it. Chapter 3, verse 16, 2 Timothy. Let's see what that one says. Oh, yeah. What does it say? People say, well, what's your resume? What's your credentials? Yes. Let's look at the resume and credentials of the Word of God, church, beginning in verse 15, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Yes. Oh, man. First and foremost, getting right with God through faith which is in Christ. Now, what does it say about the scriptures? Well, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. There's your living word there, sister. Yes, yes. All right, so it is given by inspiration, not of man, not Socrates or any of the other philosophers that chase their tail about if trees make noises falling in the woods, if nobody's around. I'm not talking about mambo-jambo. I'm talking about meaningful, eternal truth. The word of God is inspired of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. Yes. What has happened to America now that we've got away from this doctrine? We've turned into a bunch of reprobates. Yes. We don't know a man from a woman. We don't know up from down. We don't know anything. People now say they ain't either man or woman. What in the world does that even mean? You are or you are not. You're confused. You're confused. <coughs> it's not right. Oh, heaven forbid, I'm not going to go down that lane today. But listen, we get rid of the word of God, we lose all doctrine for moral living in this country. Amen, you're right. How does a sailor sail the sea without a north, south, east, west? Huh? Can't. Yeah, how, how do you even do that? You can't, effectively. And you, Christian, church, the lost, whomever, we cannot navigate life and we're all drifting toward eternity's waterfall. I promise you that. Yes. You're not going to quit life. Suicide's not going to do it. No, That's no. just going to get you there quicker. Sure. You're in this thing. And I, I tell people in funerals, there's only one thing certain in life, 100%, and that's death. And we are all going ultimately <laughs> toward that with that current. Yes. Yes. And the only way we can do this is with God. Only way, only way. And you need this. Yes. Let me read its resume. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That not mean perfect, ladies. Your husband's never going to be perfect, okay? I'm so far from perfect. Husbands, your wives are never going to be perfect, but they're going to be complete in Christ. 
That's what perfect means in the New Testament. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God will give you everything you need if you just go by this companion in life. He'll make every woman God's woman. He'll make every man God's man. Just hold to his word. So let me close my Bible before I scare anybody to death and think I'm going to keep preaching until 1230. When I was a young man in church, a kid rather, and I, I would see these preachers, and preachers I sat under were a lot tougher than the preachers singing today, a lot tougher than me too. Them guys, I'd tell how long they was going to be preaching by what article they'd take. Their tie come off, their coat come off, their shirt come out, or their seat, uh, you know. <clears throat> That guy two hours into it, his tie was over here, his jacket over here, his shirt tails out. <clears throat> At any rate, let me say this. Here's the reason. Jesus didn't, and please, let's, 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 let's not miss this here. Because if Jesus would have turned the bread, if Jesus would have turned the stones into bread, he would have rejected his own word. He's right. He would have accepted Satan's word. It all comes down to that. You cannot reject that book and successfully live for God. No, no. Cannot do it. 